coming up on This Week in Startups. You and I have a, are going to have a difference of opinion uh, I, I, on, on Lyft versus Uber. I tend to be, you know, I'm bullish on Lyft long term. I was on the board there for many years as we were brawling with uh, with Travis and crew over at Uber. And, uh, and I, I think they've got a... What uh, was that of, like? What was that like going up against Travis? Hell, hell on earth. It was hell on earth. It was hell on earth. <laughs> It's, it's like, it, that's what I knew for sure. I was never going to found another company. And I'm like, what these guys are going through. Oh man, the, the hijinks behind the scenes. We could do a whole other live stream on that. Yeah, that could be a two hour episode. This Week in Startups is brought to you by NordVPN is improving VPN services globally. Access content from over 59 countries and stay safe online. Go to nordvpn.com slash twist or use twist at checkout to get 73% off a two-year plan plus an extra bonus gift. Disruptive Advertising. Get $1,000 off your first month of service at disruptiveadvertising.com slash twist. And Our Crowd helps you invest early in pre-IPO companies alongside professional VCs. If you're interested in investing, you can join Our Crowd for free at o u r c r o w d dot com slash twist. All right. Next up on the program, in his first appearance on this week in startups, is Jeff Lewis. He is a self-described failed entrepreneur and now vibe capitalist, who's actually been doing quite well as an investor. Uh, he's with a uh, Bedrock Capital and has been there since twenty. 17 which he started after leaving founders fund bedrock uh according to pitchbook has six billion dollars in assets under management 260 million in dry powder you probably know some of the startups uh canva when we had uh, melanie on the program back on episode 939 uh, he invested in c steve my greek brother uh from cameo episode 963 if you haven't uh seen that episode he was a great guest too and uh, recently, we had uh, Garrett Langley on from Flock Safety and Investment I missed, but I thought was absolutely incredible, a little controversial, but uh, overall, I think a very important startup that tracks license plates in neighborhoods to reduce crime. That was episode 1249. He also uh, led the Series B in a startup called Lyft, which got absolutely demolished by Uber. Welcome to the program, Jeff Lewis. What's up, Jason? What a what a great intro. I thought you would I had to have fun with the intro since you are absolutely an irrepressible, delightful, candid uh, personality on Twitter. Is that a is that how you've been your whole life? Just absolutely unfiltered and candid, or is this a, a character you play on Twitter? Uh, well, it's neither. It's neither. Uh, it is. Uh, it's been a recent development, I'd say. I'd say over since uh, I'd say 2019 was kind of a turning point for me, where I decided, you know what, I've spent so much time caring so much what other people think about me. Mm. Uh, I, I'm just going to stop caring, and it was sort of an evolution. I'd I'd say it started in 2019. It sort of got accelerated through COVID, and at this point, there's like one stakeholder who I care about, which is the entrepreneurs that I work with. That that's the only person I care about. And beyond that, I'm just I'm just myself. If we vibe, we vibe. If we don't, we don't. And uh, that's kind of the way it is. Well, you know what? Having independent success as an investor and coming to this realization is completely freeing, and will make you a great guest on podcasts at the very least. Because my I have an X Y axis for great guests, which is how successful are you, and how candid are you. And typically, as people get more successful, they perceive they have something to lose. So their answers become more staged and media trained. And then the best guests are, you know, Chamath or Keith Raboy or David Sachs or Mark Cuban or Chris Saka. Because as their success goes up, their candidness goes up and it makes it just so much easier. So uh, let's go back a little bit. Uh, tell me about uh, the failed startup and not being able because i saw you talk about this uh, in a talk you gave at web summit which was pretty funny uh in the web summit talk you talked about how you wanted to be a legendary entrepreneur and absolutely did not come close you were pretty self-deprecating <laughs> uh which was charming uh but that that led eventually led to you becoming a uh, investor so let's start there what was the startup you created 
and um, why didn't it succeed? And what did you learn? Well, the startup was ultimately uh, this company called Top Guest, which it actually wasn't a failure. We, we sold the company and, and it was a sort of two to three X for our investors and we made money as founders. But on a relative basis, it was a, it was a failure, but we didn't lose anyone's money, which is, which is always important when you're an entrepreneur, at least from my vantage point now as an investor, certainly. And Jay Cal, you were one of the first people that actually uh, was pitched the startup okay. uh, because we launched the first version of the company at TechCrunch 50, which I believe you were the co-owner ah, yes. of back at, back yeah, at the time. I was. Uh, and it was, it was called, uh, it was called Udors, uh, initially. We ended up pivoting it. Uh, we auditioned for TechCrunch 50 in the old Sequoia offices. Yep. And uh, it was a sort of a very auspicious start to a very inauspicious, uh, inauspicious exit. So, you know, sort of fast forward two and a half years, one pivot later, uh, no product market fit. I burned through sort of several team members and, and there's sort of a, a shoestring team. What was the original business idea? And then what was the pivot? People always love a good pivot. Yeah. I mean, the original business idea ended up getting executed correctly by quite honestly, Instagram and Pinterest. So it was, you could tag brands and places in your photos. So you're trying to create a new photo sharing app. We launched it about a year before Instagram uh, or, or two or three years, pardon me. Um, the execution was just horrible. I mean, I'm not an engineer. I'm not a designer. I'm sort of like a business thinker type person. And uh, we just never had those chops. Uh, so it was about, uh, it was about sort of tagging brands and places in your pictures. We then pivoted it when we saw that like Foursquare, remember like 2010, 2011, Foursquare Guala getting momentum uh, to basically be, you could, uh, you could earn uh, rewards, uh, whether they were sort of like loyalty points from actual loyalty programs like airlines and hotels or cash rewards for like checking into places. And we called that business top guest. Ended up selling it to a privately held travel company. Uh, it was a brutal pivot. It was really like we had a business that didn't work. We kind of did a 180. Uh, and then ended up e eking out an exit. Uh, and it was sort of a two and a half year journey from, for me from like 29 to mid 2011. So it sounds like the lessons there were, hey, design and execution are paramount. You had the right idea, but you didn't execute at a high level. So you never got enough traction and product market fit. So that's just a super important lesson for founders. Why don't you double click on that and expand on it? in terms of how you carry that lesson forward as an investor when you work with new entrepreneurs? Yeah. Like mean, how do you fix that problem, in other words? Well, it's, it's, it, it, all comes down to the, it all comes down to the entrepreneurs starting the company. And so at least on, on our end here at Bedrock, anything where you, uh, that's sort of heavily product-driven, we're, we're digging super deep on the, on the sort of chops around engineering, around product and, and, and design. Um, you know, the other, the other pieces, if you're investing pre product market fit, um, you, you sort of, uh, I found that you always want sort of a not super great articulation of how the company is going to get to product market fit. I feel like the better the articulation is of like how you're going to get to product market fit before you have it, uh, the less likely you are to get to product market fit. So when I was pitching Udors, when I was pitching Top Guest, I had a great narrative on how that business was going to end up transcending, was going to end up being huge. Ultimately, I just didn't have the ability or the skill to actually architect that product, nor was I successful in building a team that could do that. So yeah, I was pretty much a failed entrepreneur on those vectors, not financially, but certainly executionally, and realized that I sucked at building software companies. But it turned out that I you know, felt like I was pretty good at figuring out which other software companies or tech companies that weren't my own were going to work, which sort of led to, to me becoming an investor a decade ago. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it's, it's really important lessons that reflect back to you when I'm hearing, hey, you got the ideas right, and you had the strategy right. Yep. And you were so good at the storytelling of the idea of the strategy, and that you told the story right, so you got the money. But at the end of the day, that money, that story, that market has to manifest itself in a product that then touches customers and they have to fall in love with it. And if you could go back and do it again, the next piece you talked about was recruiting talent that was elite. And that if you are not able to make a world class product, the only other option, if you're not a designer UX person yourself or a coder, is to be an incredible recruiter of talent. And that becomes a deciding factor, I think, in success. If you look at some of the great idea founders, strategists, Steve Jobs had great taste, but he also had Johnny Ive, right? 
and 100%. you know uh you, know, you can go right down the line with other great entrepreneurs travis you know surrounded himself with great deal makers great product people great designers you can recruit and pay for those uh skills eventually do you want to increase your online security well don't we all if so you need to hear about nordvpn nordvpn offers a vpn that stands for virtual private network with benefits such as helping customers stay safe online and you get to access content from over 59 different countries by changing your virtual location with just one click and you're never gonna miss your favorite show again this keeps you safe while using public wi-fi which can be a gold mine for hackers I tell you this because I have sensitive information. I use NordVPN to protect myself anytime. My phone, my iPad, my laptop, my Chromebook is out on the road. I need to protect myself. And I was in Italy. The girls wanted to watch something on Disney Plus. It was like, we don't have Disney Plus in Italy. Uh uh. Boom, put my VPN on. We're back in the game. NordVPN has an amazing Cyber Month deal for my listeners, Twist listeners. It's amazing how affordable VPNs are. You can now get in the United States, I kid you not, NordVPN for about $3 a month. Go to Nord, N O R D, VPN.com slash twist, or use the code twist at checkout, and you're going to get, I kid you not, 73% off your two year plan plus a bonus. Game. Just buy the two year plan. This way you don't have to worry about it. You need to be safe. And NordVPN is how you're going to do that. NordVPN.com slash twist. Now that you're carried forward to an investor, we always get asked as investors, Jeff, what are the qualities of entrepreneurs that lead to success? We've identified some of the ones that were successful for you, and you were able to get that exit, which uh, is obviously uh, speaks to your ability to tell the, the story and identify an opportunity. When you carry forward now and you've made these investments, are there things that for you, you find important in founders? You know, it is always impossible to assess the founders outside of the context of the companies. And so I can, uh, there's some people out there that are like, you know, someone like Sam Lesson who wants to invest just in the people before they have a company. So I can't do that. I have to know. What is the business they're going to build? Uh, and how do they tell me the story? And then I use how they tell me the story uh, to basically, because I'm so good at storytelling, I'm so good at narrative, I think I have sort of an innate ability to figure out, okay, what are the holes here? Or what doesn't quite add up? And or like really unpack and double click in your parlance, Jason, like every layer of that story. Uh, and then through that narrative, plus like what they've built and the team they've surrounded themselves with, it's always like a company specific bottom-up build on is this a great entrepreneur or not and is this entrepreneur going to go all the way like a few common threads are all they're always cliched so i hate sort of giving the common threads but it is sort of this like there is a real like really long time horizon mission that feels even more important today now that i think sort of the you know public markets are sort of not not looking very good so i think any any company that's going to be valuable 10 15 years from now needs to be building on sort of a very long time horizon and and have an actual like vision that if it works can be one of the biggest companies, you know, if not in the US in the world. So that's kind of what we're looking for now. So the authenticity of like how the founder tells that story and the way it manifests through the team members he or she uh, or they have surrounded themselves with uh, is, is obviously really relevant. Uh, and then I do sort of I am really biased towards people that have some sort of like a something they want to prove a chip off their shoulder. Not insecurity per se. I, I think you can sort of select for highly insecure people and that can work in certain contexts, but it can also blow up horribly. Uh, you know, I'd rather find people that are, that are confident, but that sort of really do have, have something to prove, which is, which is like super cliched, but, uh, but I think is, is true of a lot of these great founders. And, you know, I, I'd say like Garrett from Flock, it's a company that, that you mentioned, you know, we, we here at Bedrock led a very early round there, sort of a series A1. Have doubled, tripled, quadrupled down into that company over every one of our funds, every one of their rounds. He's the perfect combination of like huge ass mission. I mean, crime in the US, we spend a hundred billion dollars a year on policing. It's, it's not working very well to, to sort of put it mildly. Huge market. If you can actually be the technology company that solves crime, he is motivated by that mission and he does feel like he has something to prove. But he's not insecure. So like that is my modal sort of founder product, like everything lines up on that company. I think 
that was the that was literally the company I was going to go to uh, to to build the example because if you look at what Flock Security does for people who don't know, they basically build uh, a system that you could put outside of your house or on a road anywhere or on a a a, a phone pole, a lamppost that will uh, have a small computer in it with a camera. It reads license plates. It puts those license plates and timestamps, essentially the metadata, not pictures of the people because they care about privacy. And then if you put these into your neighborhood, crime goes down 50%, 75%. Because when people commit crimes in neighborhoods, they typically drive a car in. Now you have every single license plate that's come into that neighborhood. They typically keep it on for 60 to 90 days. It's not infinite. Uh, and when there's a crime, they can look and say who drove down Main Street, who drove to 7th Street, what were the license plates, they can identify the license plates of the people who live in that neighborhood and neighborhoods are buying these and individuals are buying them. Uh, and it is just one of the perfect ways, uh, as you said, if you think about a 10 or 20 year mission, my lord, making a neighborhood safer through these cameras is, is a mission that's going to take decades. And who doesn't want to live in a more safe community? And we care about privacy. But you, you could tell when I talked to him, you know, Garrett, he was very attuned when you, when you talked about storytelling, not only of why this is important. Obviously, people want to be safer. But he ha was incredibly thoughtful and considered about the details. And I think to build on your assessment, when somebody really does care deeply about the mission, and they tell the story correctly, inevitably, they have thought through each of those edge cases and details, and they have a thoughtful answer to it that you may not agree with. But I don't know if you've had this experience with founders, but every question you can think of, they've already thought it through. They've got the answer. Now they're going to test it, it may or may not be right. But that was what I loved about that particular investment that you made. I'm super jealous that you were able to get in that one early because I was literally going to buy it for my neighborhood after we had a series of break ins. And uh, he told me, Oh, yeah, by the way, I just looked up your zip code. Um, yeah, we were already we're in talking to them. <laughs> we're already talking to your police department in your in your town. So uh, congratulations on that one. When you look at cameo, and you look at Canva, when did you engage with those companies? What did you love about those founders and their mission? Sure. Well, I can't take any credit for for the cameo investment. I was my partner, one of my partners here at Bedrock, yeah. uh, who who found that. But I I loved I, I loved the founder Steve. I felt like he was someone who was just going to be underestimated by uh, by by investors because he's you know he's a real person. Okay, so yeah. so many people out there are just are just like uh, these sort of like facsimile, like not real. They're just sort of standard talking points. No personality, no energy. Steve is just who he is, and it's all out there. And I'm like, this is someone who's going to really resonate with celebrities, with agents in that entire world, uh, and and it's going to take it all the way because Steve, honestly, I thought he was a founder who wanted to get invited to quite all the best parties around the world. I thought that was going to be something that was going to be very motivating for him, the founder of Cameo. And in order to actualize on that, he was going to have to build a very valuable business, and Cameo was going to have to play sort of a key role in the entertainment industry. And and uh, it was just sort of a too dumb to fail idea. So sometimes you never want to overthink things. It's sort of like, okay, letting this sort of long tail of influencers and celebrities have another way to monetize, have a way to connect one on one with their fans. That idea is just too dumb to fail. So our, our thesis on Cameo was, uh, it's too dumb to fail. Uh, and then on Canva, uh, it's actually a huge mess because I should have invested a lot more. I mean, there's the category of misses that you talked about. Uh, where it's like you see something or, or you don't see it early enough and you miss it for that reason. Uh, in the case of Canva, I invested like a tiny amount personally. And then on behalf of Founders Fund, when I was a partner there before I left to start Bedrock about four years ago, uh, but did this back in 2015 in the series Seed uh, in Canva. And if I'd only invested like, you know, whatever, 10x more, uh, I would have been just a massive win. At this point, it's still great, but I didn't put nearly enough into that. In that one, it was just the founders were unbelievable. I mean, Melanie and Cliff, uh, again, it's like all the stuff we've talked about already. You go through this set of questions. They have answers to everything. They've thought through all of these things. And they saw a market before it existed. They saw this huge market of being able to design online very easily, not for front-end web development like our other portfolio company, Vercel Helps Enables or something like Figma. But just for the everyday use case, like a social media manager or an assistant or like invitations or like everyday people. So I felt like it would just apply to a, a, a broad swath of the population. But I made a huge sin, uh, error or sin. I like to call it sort of my, 
my original sin on that one, which is once I knew it was working after the seed investment, not like aggressively trying to get more capital into that company over the follow on rounds. And I really learned from that one. I mean, friends of mine like Wesley Chan at Felicis, he did the Series A. Then other people that I know did the Series B and the Series C. And it's like every one of those rounds, I should have been like flying to Australia to their headquarters, like trying to like preempt the rounds. And I just totally dropped the ball there. Have Apple's new privacy updates impacted your attribution from paid ads? I bet it has. Well, good news. The folks at Disruptive Advertising can help you. Disruptive Advertising manages over $250 million a year in advertising spend, and they are trusted by hundreds of brands like Adobe and Scott's miracle Grow. So if your Google and Facebook ads are not scaling like they used to, you should do a consultation with Disruptive. They will look to help you scale your spend profitably. How? By diversifying your ad strategy on less popular platforms. They'll track every single dollar that you spend or earn, and their marketing consultants focus on end-to-end tracking across your CRM, marketing automations, and e-commerce platform. They care less about return on spend. What they really focus on is contribution margin, profitability, and closed deals. So here is your call to action. Get $1,000 off your first month of service at disruptiveadvertising.com slash twist. Disruptiveadvertising.com slash twist for $1,000 off. Absolutely. You want to ride your winners, something we talk about on the All In podcast over and over again. And uh, Peter Thiel, actually, in the 2015 interview, um, perhaps was talking about Facebook, um, but just not plowing more and more money into the winners. And it was something I fixed in my game when I went out to raise my second fund and then my third fund. You know, people were like, okay, you put 25K or 50K into this famous unicorn. Why didn't you put more? And I was like, well, I didn't have any more capital. Uh, and then since that time, we now invest in five, six, seven rounds. Just every round, we put a little bit more money and try to keep our pro rata or sometimes even go super pro rata. And my Lord, if you invested in the $250 million round of com.com, the billion dollar round of com.com, you would feel pretty great about it, let alone an Uber or Which a Which you Robin did, Hood. by the way. You did, you did those rounds. <laughs> well, with com, yeah, we, we, we did put a little bit of money in and then we also took a little money off the table. And you know that's actually a new phenomenon. Companies like this are growing so quickly that you could have one set of LPs that's happy to invest at a seed round, but after they get to 50 or 100x on their investment, would like some liquidity. And then you've got another group of investors who very much want to invest only when the company gets to a billion dollars and they're looking for a 10x and they want to put a bigger check in, but they don't want to take all the zeros you get when you're investing in those seed stage companies. So it's actually a very interesting moment in time where you can, as a capital allocator, be doing both simultaneously. You could be selling and you could be investing, just different pools of uh, capital. And we're seeing that with people with multiple uh, rounds of uh, different pools of capital for growth, etc. I found this one company that you had invested in called Praxis, P-R-A-X-I-S. And they're trying to build a city? A country. A cr- they're trying a to country, build a country. A crypto state? Okay. Yeah. So I, is this your jump the shark moment? Like you're Peter Thiel, I'm going to start seasteading and avoid taxes. What is the thesis on this seemingly crazy idea? Well, there's there's no way that it would it would enable me to avoid taxes because I'm just a minority min- minority shareholder. So there's okay. definitely no no angle like that there. But, oh, uh, I think maybe for the citizens of if, said if, crypto, <laughs> you know, world, are they trying to find yeah. an island and literally create a new country? Well, it's not going to be a sea said, presumably. So they're they're looking for some some land. Yeah, they're looking for some land in the Mediterranean, uh, and they're gonna they're, they have a plan to tokenize. You know, it's one where, uh, so this is sort of, you know, goes to the, another attribute I look for in people, which is tenacity. And so I met these founders, Dryden and Charlie, like three years ago now, I think two and a half or three years ago. And they just articulated sort of a very different version of this vision, but sort of they, they had a high level vision that basically there should be a lot more, you know, innovation on, on countries and nation states. And the seasteading idea was, was interesting, but the actual execution of doing it on a seastead. Uh, is maybe not the right way to do it. People don't really want to live on on seasteads, maybe. But all that said, maybe there is room for for more new countries. Uh, and then they sort of have iterated and innovated over the years with really building a pretty large and hyper engaged online community. Which you know, you more than anyone know the value of having that. Where they've got, I think at this point, almost ten thousand members in this in this online community that only launched recently. 
uh, really that want to move to this new nation state once it exists that are also uh, have a lot of overlap with the crypto world. A lot of these folks have done really well in sort of meme currencies and Bitcoin and Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies. And so it's sort of all coming together now in this vision of can we actually build a crypto state uh, where, where people will move? And it's, it's not actually about taxes at all. It's about uh, trying to create a society that's sort of healthier, uh, where people can live better lives, uh, more, flour- more flourishing lives uh, with a new uh, economic system and a new system of laws and governance built on the blockchain. Now, what in practice that means, I have no clue, but I like <laughs> the pitch. I yeah. like the pitch. And, uh, you know, is it worth, is it worth putting in a few million bucks and backing, backing this team? Absolutely. So we did it. We're delighted to have led the seed around there. And if it works, it's going to be big. Yeah. I mean, we would put that in the moonshot category of Absolutely investing. A moonshot. Yeah. Chances are very difficult for something like this to work, but you just have to ask yourself, what if it does? That would change the world. Absolutely. Okay. So for the people who are watching this episode of this week in startups live, which we are increasingly doing live interviews with the guests who are brave enough to do it uh you can if you want to become part of the notification gang which we call the noti gang you just go to youtube.com slash this week in to subscribe to our youtube channel and hit the bell and then that means you'll get a notification whenever we go live and if you get in there you'll then watch this episode live or future episodes live as opposed to waiting a day or two for us to process the video and release it to our podcasting stream which means you do get to ask a question to our guests and we're going to start going to guest questions in just a moment so if you're listening to us live go ahead and put in your a concise question and it could be anything from capital allocation to startups to product uh, to business to careers any of that is on the table let's talk for a moment jeff about valuations and people getting credit for extremely high valuations before they reach the milestones you and i work in an industry capital allocators, venture capitalists, uh, which has traditionally been a milestone-based system of investment. You get 12 to 24 months of capital, you make some uh, promises, some plans for what you'll achieve, and then if you hit those goals or exceed them, you then are typically able to raise more capital in order to reach the next milestone. In today's market, we're seeing people get credit for two or three milestones before they actually hit them. You started, uh, you know, five or six years ago in this game, and it has changed wildly. How are you thinking about valuations that are not commensurate with milestones in 2021 going into 2022? Well, it's always been the same for me, which is I've, I've actually been doing investing in tech companies since 2012. And I thought we're in a bubble on valuation since like 2016. I've, I felt particularly at sort of growth stage enterprise SaaS, anything that can easily comp to the public markets. I felt the valuations are generally like way too high. And so you have to basically find the few counter examples. And, you know, I think we're in a few of them, things like Vercel, things like Flock Safety, Rippling, arguably at the growth stage where there's something really special with that company and the, and the founder and the, the momentum where a super high multiple can be justified, where you can give them the credit, even in a correction. But basically, we've been in an environment where all anyone's thinking about uh, is the micro. Uh, everyone, it's like, oh, it's the company, it's the revenue multiples. Uh, and if you're a founder, you shouldn't be focused on the micro. But the job of an investor, in my opinion, is you have to also think about the macro and the markets. And I do think that things are clearly massively correcting. So I'm, I'm elated, to be honest with you, Jason, because I've been waiting for this moment for five, six years. I thought I thought things are overvalued since 2016, and uh, I'm delighted for for this moment to finally come. I think founders need the a moment being re- a correction, and maybe people yeah, coming back down to earth. Lot. Yeah, it's going to take a while to filter down to where we play uh, at the in the private markets, and you know, in the case of Bedrock, and I think uh, the stuff that you do, it's a little bit earlier stage. So, like the latest, we'll usually go here as like a Series D. At the very late stage, most of what we do is series A and B, uh, and then, you know, other weird things like crypto and, and things like that, and a little bit of seed. But so it'll take a year or two years to trickle down, I think, to valuations here be at the early stages. But, uh, yeah, there's going to be a correction, I, I, I think, because you have the growth companies are just being revalued now by the market, given, you know, all of the crazy macro conditions, which 
aren't news to anyone. We've talked, I'm sure you've talked about these with other guests. All around the world, tech companies are innovating and driving return for investors. Well, our crowd analyzes many of these companies. They search across the global private market. Then they select the ones with the greatest growth potential. And finally, they bring them to you from personalized medicine to cybersecurity to robotics, one of my favorite, and quantum computing and much more. Whether it's in a state-of-the-art lab, a startup garage, or anywhere in between, our crowd identifies innovators so you can invest when growth potential is greatest. And that's early. Our crowd's accredited investors have already invested over $1 billion in growing tech companies. And many of their members have benefited from 46 IPOs or exits. Now you can truly diversify your portfolio by investing early in innovative private market companies at our crowd. Join the fastest growing venture capital investment community at rcrowd.com slash twist. Go to the website, you sign up and you get to read all these amazing deal memos, which will let you learn how to be a great investor. And you're going to learn about the future of technology. One of the best parts about being an investor is getting to read those deal memos. That's rcrowd.com slash T-W-I-S-T to sign up for free today. So uh, here's a question from our notification gang, the Noti gang. Uh, Paul asks, what's the one thing Jeff believes that most people don't believe? I guess this is the Peter Thiel contrarian question. Is there something that you believe that you find most people disagree with you on? Yeah, I, I believe that anyone who's familiar with that question should never answer it. So that's the one <laughs> thing I believe. So I'm familiar with the question. I strongly believe that one should never answer it if asked. So that's my answer. In other to the words, question. if you figured something out about how to win at poker, best you keep that to yourself. If you have an edge, why would you ever give it away? I've always felt the same way about that question. When people ask me that question, what have you figured out? Never, I'm answer, like, never answer that why one. Why would I tell never you? Answer that one. Right. Why would I never tell you? Long. That makes absolutely no sense. Um, okay. Uh, Zen Prophet asks a quick question here. Uh, how important is a Stanford EE? And I'll expand that question for you, which is in our line of work in 2021, going into 2022, how important are these Ivy League degrees or even a technical degree versus just the overall ability to execute uh, making brilliant products? Uh, there might even be net negatives at this point. Um, you know, in, I can only speak from experience. In my case, I went to sort of a random school in Canada. I grew up in Canada. I didn't go to any uh, son of two, two school teachers. I didn't go to an Ivy League school or Stanford, no engineering background. It's worked out pretty well for me. And quite honestly, the best founders in our portfolio, uh, I don't think any of them went to Stanford. Maybe there's one exception. But when I think about our transcendent founders, the next generation that I'm super bullish on, they don't have these pedigrees. Um, and, and there's a way in which it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of, you think that things are going to be much easier than they are if you go to one of these schools, maybe, and or particularly in like E or Simsys or Stanford. It's like, okay, everything's going to be super easy for me. And that has been true for the last decade. So it has been very easy uh, as a founder on a relative basis, relative to history over the past decade. And I do think that it's going to just be much harder going forward. And it's better if you're not trained that your, your life is going to be super easy. That's my one, one person's opinion here. Yeah, and I, I can't disagree that, you know, people who come out of those schools have had uh, incredible opportunities presented to them historically. But in today's market where, you know, these degrees are incredibly expensive, you might actually limit the risk you're about to take or allowed to take or just practically can take because you're 250 in debt or $100,000 in debt, whatever it is. You can't afford to take a sixty, seventy thousand dollar $70,000 job or a 5k a month draw to be a founder, because you've got 3k a month in, uh, you know, bills you have to pay on this master's degree you got or, or your MBA, it's very hard to take risk. And you might have to take this job as an analyst at Goldman Sachs, and just push paper around and, and do reports as opposed to do something actually creative with your life. And most people, uh, the skills that are being taught in these schools are now so much further behind the reality of what tools are being built, uh, you know, on the edge of technology, there's no course at MIT, I'm certain on how to, you know, work on the blockchain or build technologies, you're gonna learn that by going into a discord server or GitHub or wherever, or learn it, you know, in some chat room. So uh, we're both in absolute alignment on that. 
And I will say like to his credit, Peter Thiel was right about that before anyone else. I mean, Peter Thiel called out this college thing uh, really before anyone else did. And I think he was with his Thiel Fellowship or whatever back in like 2010 or 2011. And now that's just cons consensus knowledge that like, yeah, there's like this huge insane student debt problem with uh, with college. I don't think you should answer the Peter Thiel question, but credit where it's due on, on calling out the college bubble uh, very early there. All right, uh, Noti Gang member, original OG Bob G, asks, if you could invest in one category, what is your favorite and why? Do you have a top category that you just find delightful to invest in? No, I don't like categories. Uh, the, be the best assets are like N of one assets. So it's like, you know, everything great gets mis mistakenly categorized into something else, some, some category that doesn't really exist. I don't like the categories. Uh, I, you and I are in alignment on this one. I always tell people, you know, when I invested in Uber or other people invested in, you know, Postmates or Airbnb, the concept of on demand was not a term. That term came five years later uh, when some analyst or journalist decided to say, oh, you know what? You can get things on demand by pressing a button on Instacart. And uh, that's kind of similar to Airbnb and it's kind of similar to Hotel Tonight. So it's the on demand economy. But that wasn't a category. And the only things I can think of are business models as categories. So I'm going to build upon Bob's great question. Are there business models, ways of making money that you find uh, scale very nicely or appealing for a venture investment? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, obviously, like to state sort of a truism, software is super special. So if you have an ultra high margin software business, that's very valuable. Um, and And there's no other category of asset like that even things like bitcoin which i you know i am quite bullish long term on on cryptocurrency writ large a lot of this is just speculation today mm -hmm. um software high margin software is like a one of a kind category business model to invest in i'd say maybe the sort of undervalued version of this would be all of the heat on software for so many years has been you know high margin saas high margin enterprise saas I'd say something like what you did with Com, Jason, consumer SaaS, consumer subscription, where people are consumers, they're not companies, they're not businesses, they're people, and they're paying a monthly subscription for software. Now, not media, like software you're engaging with that makes your life better, like Com or like Duolingo or businesses like that. We have a thesis at Bedrock that those businesses, you know, there's a lot of those opportunities that are going to be very valuable in the future. So like consumer SaaS is a business model I'm pretty interested in right now. And, and we are here on the team. Yeah, 100% in agreement. After our experience with Calm, we went on to invest in FitPod, which is like nice. fitness as a subscription, then Steezy, dance as a subscription. Then we did two in music, tone bass, classical music, subscription, musician, music, singing, guitar, piano, as a subscription. Uh, and right on down the line, brilliant, teaching you math and science, physics as a subscription. And if you think about it, I, I like how you broke that down, which is it's not just music and Netflix, Spotify and Netflix. Those ones are obvious. They were the first tip of the spear. But after music and uh, movies and television shows, people have other interests. And just like magazines, I always make the magazine analogy in the 90s. If you were passionate about fly fishing or bow and arrow hunting or muscle cars or Italian sports cars, there was a magazine that you could get $5 a month to $50 a year to $30 a year to, to have a subscription. And then that went away. And now it exists as apps or, you know, otherwise online subscriptions. So uh, consumer subscriptions are just so delightful. They have higher churn than SaaS, like business SaaS. Yep. But, you know, and I've seen so many of my contemporaries, I introduce them to companies and so many people turn down doing the Series A, Series B of Steezy or FitBod or Calm even. Uh, because they were like, the churn's too high. And I'm like, yeah, but the product is so affordable and people want to try guitar, but it doesn't stick for them. It's not like Zoom or Slack or Salesforce or, you know, w whatever, you know, Zendesk, whatever product people become obsessive with as a SaaS product that becomes integrated uh, into their workflow. It's just completely uh, different. Um, question comes in from uh, Bearscript. Do you invest in competitors in your portfolio? I'm going to expand this question to add one, which is, what do you do when you've got 50, 100, 300 investments, and then, you know, some new technology like DAOs, cryptos, NFTs happen, and hey, maybe people start adding that functionality into their products, and now 
companies that weren't competitors in your portfolio are now, you know, pivoting or evolving to be actual competitors. It does happen. How do you manage that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tricky situation. I'd say like two cuts on it. One is sort of applicable to everyone. One is specific to us at Bedrock. The applicable to everyone cut is I think that sort of ex ante, if you're a VC, you shouldn't invest in two directly competitive companies unless the, unless the entrepreneurs know that you're doing that and are okay with it. So ex ante, we would not day one, if the company is directly competitive, invest in two directly competitive companies. Typically, if there's lots of competition, we don't even want to invest. If there's like 20 of the companies and we bedrock have to use our sleuthing skills to find the best one, we don't even want to get involved in that category. Now, there is an ex post scenario, which you alluded to, where like two companies start off doing very different things over many years or a decade converge. In that situation, it's not our problem. Look, and you know, I'm straight up with the entrepreneurs. If you guys are converging, uh, we're, we're going to, we can do, information silos, we can like roll off the board if you want, we can not share information between the two companies, we're happy to give up all of that, like, and just like, let it ride. But if the companies converge over many years, like that's that that just happens in business. That's part of like what it means to be in business. And then the bedrock specific cut is we actually just don't invest in very many companies. So I think that's one of the unique thing with us. I think we have less than 50 companies across our whole portfolio, across all our funds. Uh, We don't do that much. We try and pick things we really like and then concentrate capital on the few winners. So we've never actually run into this issue yet in our portfolio of of two directly competitive companies. And uh, I think that does speak to being a Series A, Series B investor. You're placing a very large bet on a small number of companies. Uh, To build on your answer, when you have an accelerator you're got an exception from this accelerators tend to invest in, yeah. you know, very small amounts of money in a large number of companies who are still figuring out what their products are. So we do not avoid uh, conflicts in our accelerator, unless it's a copycat product, which I just find offensive and don't like if somebody just photocopies calm. Nah, but we had a company that did, you know, a story app for putting children to bed. So arguably, it's five or 10% overlapping with com and we felt, you know, we and I've talked to the com founders about this. Hey, if we, we have people who are adjacent, and we invest in them. That's actually good. Because if there is an acquisition down the road, we obviously won't share information about the two companies, but we could make the introduction at some point and we have some common DNA. And then for platforms like the syndicate.com, increasingly now that we have multiple syndicates, Unless something's a copycat product, which I just did have a copycat product that I said I don't, I'm not comfortable syndicating, where it's a platform where companies can syndicate their their deals, so it's not exactly like I'm picking them. But when I do pick them, some of the companies I pick, some of them are picked by the audience of uh, investors. You know, if I pick them, I'm, I'm I'm avoiding conflicts. If the audience picks them, we're kind of independent about that. All right, let's take a look at your questions coming in again. If you want to ask questions. You uh, will find out about live interviews, live news reads going on when Molly Wood joins the program in January. You'll be able to ask Molly Wood questions and hear us in our new uh, co-hosting roles, uh, chopping up the news live every day uh, in the mornings, typically, sometimes in the afternoon if there's a breaking news story. You can do that by going to youtube.com slash this weekend. Click the subscribe button right next to it is a bell. You want to click that bell and about five times a week, six times a week, you're going to get an alert when I go live. You get to jump in here and ask questions. So another question coming in, uh, should NFTs have a block style ledger to avoid theft and copying? I'll expand this question. So you can start with, aside from this specific question about theft and copying, um, do you F with NFTs? Do you think that's an intelligent, interesting business model? Do you think it's nonsense or somewhere in between? Well, I definitely, I definitely have with them. Um, I, I created one. I minted one uh, and sold it on OpenSea and donated the the proceeds to the the graphic designer who helped me uh, make it. I assume uh, this was it, you with your shirt off in an ocean in Hawaii because you, were you no, doing no, your was, I, I was, you do your vibe updates with your shirt off? I was I was shirtless, but it was a it was a it was a rendering of me, so it wasn't an actual shirtless photo. It was just a rendering. Got it. It was um, the metaverse version of you. Got it. It was the metaverse. It was the metaverse shirtless Jeff. That's right. I think I might have been yep. pantsless as well, but there was some sort of loincloth or something. So I f with them, but uh, I do I, I I do think that you know there's the the new stuff now with uh, with crypto punks with the copyrights. Stuff. I don't really love what's going on there. I've looked at sort of like the the board apes and the lazy lion stuff. I think we're in very much like 1999 world on NFTs. 
I think it's 1999 on the meme cryptocurrencies. I don't, I, and I, I lump those together. I know they're very different, but I lump this together. It's 1999. There very well might be real future of NFTs. I don't think we are in a world now where like long term, massive, valuable. Uh, I, I don't think it's like the next like massive asset class. I might be wrong. I would love to be wrong, actually, not for my own bank account because I mean, I'm missing out on a lot of gains, but because I think that'd be really f-ing cool. I think a lot of the people that are engaged heavily in NFTs today are just incredibly talented like very interesting people. And it would be great for there to be a wealth transfer from sort of the type of people who collect lots of art, uh, old school art to like the people that are like minting NFTs or collecting NFTs. That would be great for society, but I don't think we're there yet. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty skeptical, but I'm, I feel like you just have to, you have to dabble in these things if you if you want to invest, because there's always a chance I'm wrong and you can't miss like the next wave or it's detrimental. Yeah, when a when a new technology like NFTs comes out, there are more problems and issues and edge cases than there maybe are uh, problems that have been solved and tightened up. Here at uh, Art Basel, where I am now, which I'm referring to as NFT Basel, <laughs> because <laughs> it's more about NFTs than it is about art. Uh, really? You know, just, that, really? Wow. There's more crypto people here than old rich people with more money than time looking to spend their last uh you know <laughs> to buy million dollar paintings but one the most interesting trend i uh, was alerted to here was the fact that um you know uh people who are running galleries or auction houses have now had a portion of their business absolutely had the rug pulled out from under them which is you buy an nft it appreciates in value the artist gets 10% of every resale. I decide I'm going to buy this. You bought it for 10,000. I'm going to buy it for 20,000. Instead of the gallery getting 30% or 40% of that sale, the original artist gets whatever it is, 10 or 20%. Y- you and I trade the asset. We never go to a gallery. You buy 100 NFTs. You immediately put them all up on OpenSea or whatever other platform and say, hey, make me an offer. Or you put them in your wallet and say, I own these. Offers can come in. And you can sell them independent of an intermediary. This is absolutely, completely disruptive yes. to the con- command and control that galleries and art dealers have. Their business is absolutely going to go to zero in the digital art space. They do not provide value in that sense. And uh, I was spending a bunch of time with uh, Mike, aka Beeple, uh, when I was here. The guy who sold the seventy million dollar NFT, and you know he did sell that through a, 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 a Sotheby's or whoever, one of the one of the auction houses. But in the future, like people's a brand, people makes a piece of art a day. It sells as an NFT, or they sell a hundred pieces of it, whatever it is. Beeple is the distribution. He does not need distribution. He is the distribution, and it would be the equivalent of, you know. Quentin Tarantino being able to produce movies directly for his audience who are buying tickets for it from him, right? And they just, which actually seems like a pretty killer idea now that I think of it. I mean, if they're Quentin trying Tarant- to do that with music too, like with Royal, yeah, uh, but yeah I mean, that could happen, Jason. Like, yeah, I mean, the NFTs might enable that. Well, music sounds like an easier one because you're talking about, you're not talking about a three year project to make Once Upon a Time in Hollywood for 100 million and get the actors and spend years making it. You're talking about making a song, which could take a week or two or three yeah. or 10 minutes if it's the Beatles, you know, and they're, and they're savants. They could just be making a song a day. You buy the rights to it. Everybody splits it. I mean, it's, it really is, I have to say, store of value and money transfer to me were inane, not important for the modern world. Use utilizations. I mean, I'm sure in an emerging country where, you know, you, you have a dictator or currency appreciation uh, and inflation that's out of control. Those things are very important, but for the rest of the world, we, we don't have money transfer storage problems. But, uh, you know, these other pieces I find super, super compelling. You have uh, described yourself as a vibe capitalist. The audience wants to know, what is the difference, Jeff, between a vibe capitalist and a venture capitalist? Well, uh, you know, look, it, it, it really is that, uh, uh, well, it's, the short answer is that uh, it's it's about uh, it's about the energy and the connection with the people, and so ultimately, 
Um, you know, the Zoom world that we were living in for like a year and a half, that world did not does not work well for Vibe Capitalists. Uh, we like I like to meet people in person, uh, connect with entrepreneurs, connect with teams. Uh, it's about there's a lot about interpersonal chemistry. And then it's about what the companies are actually doing or what the businesses are actually doing. So like NFTs, those are those are vibe assets, man. Like there's like a creative energy. There's uh, it, it's not about efficiency. It's about actually uh, creativity and, and sort of having the creators capture more of the value. That's a positive vibe. You know, there's, there's a lot of companies out there. I would argue something like, uh, like TikTok looks like there, it's about a vibe because there's all, sort of all these funny videos, but it's actually just about efficiency. It's about hooking you in uh, for as long as possible to like this pointless, mindless content and gathering as much data as possible on you. So I would juxtapose sort of vibe capitalism, vibe companies versus efficiency companies. Uh, and, uh, and I like to, I like to invest in things with vibes and I like to invest in people with vibes. My vibes are not right for everyone. Uh, very polarizing vibes. Uh, but if, it, if it's a fit, it's like a really good fit for life. And so that's just how we operate here. Uh, and it basically means that, uh, we have real personalities. We stay what we think in the boardroom. If, if you have a bedrock board member, you're going to hear our actual opinion on things. Uh, and, uh, we might not vibe in which case we won't invest and we'll leave you alone. Uh, but it's just a different approach to how we do things here. Uh, did you invest in Andrew? Uh, is that how you yes. pronounce it, Andrew? Uh, explain that company, why you invested, and uh, what's the vibe in uh, safety, security, civil defense uh, for you as a category? Well, there can't be any vibes if, if, if the U.S. is destroyed by China. So that'd be sort of the starting point. There won't be, there won't be vibes at all if we don't have... If we'll we don't be have strong We'll be vibeless. <laughs> we'll be lifeless and vibeless. So, so that's sort of that's sort of like part one. Part two, obviously, that's a founding team with insane vibes. You know, it's incubated out of the firm that I used to work at, Founders Fund. Uh, that founding team with Palmer Lucky, uh, Matt Grimm, Brian, Trey Stevens. Like that's a, a incredible vibes on the team. And then what the are they Andrew, building? What are they building? Well, they're building a lot of sh- they're building a lot of stuff. I mean, Andrew basically is uh, effectively. Uh, integrating all of the hardware and software into a common operating system. It's sort of like an OS for defense. And then they obviously have like hardware, they've got all sorts of pieces to their hardware, but like their whole lattice infrastructure sort of integrating everything in defense with this one common operating picture. Like that's a big deal. And they've built an insane go to market machine, like next level go to market machine. So like, yeah, we're, we're not huge investors there. I wish we had a lot more capital in that company. But uh, it's definitely a vibe company. Uh, I'd say, like, quite honestly, everything defense tech almost that's not the like old school primes that have been, you know, had this sort of uh, crazy uh, sort of cartel on the US defense budget for the last, you know, 50 years. Everything other than the primes like Raytheon and, and, and those guys are vibe companies. Anyone doing anything in defense that's a, a startup, I'm like super interested in digging into because I think it's so important. Would you invest? in drones robots or any autonomous weapons some people have said they won't do that google says they won't support the military uh google has made a ton of money and they live in a free country but their employees refuse to support the government that gives them the ability to do that I feel that's kind of lame but there is this issue of autonomous uh weapons weapons that can go find humans and kill them without a human behind the controls kind of controversial uh you could be certain north korea china iran other assorted dictators would build them in a heartbeat if they aren't already built would you invest in one of those yes or no well we no but we have invested in a company that is counter unmanned autonomous systems counter uas called eparis which we are extremely excited about uh this business was incubated by my friend joe lonsdale and his firm 8vc they sure. have a high-powered microwave technology, which uh, basically has multiple defense applications, uh, as well as f- dual use, which means like commercial applications as well for those of, of the w- viewers who aren't aware. But their initial go-to-market is with the US and its allies around counter UAS using this breakthrough high-powered microwave chip. Uh, so and just explain invest- UAS again for the audience. Yeah. So yeah, it's, dr- it's basically like you're talking about drones that are killing people, so autonomous weapons. This is a system that 
you know, shoots down those autonomous weapons, not with shooting them, but with sending a high powered microwave beam to mm. zap them out of the sky. And it's been tested now, you know, many, many times with an incredible uh, hit rate. So it's to basically protect us and our allies from these autonomous weapons. So if it's, if it's something that is going to protect us against these autonomous weapons, yes, we would invest in it. Would I invest in sort of a, you know, weapon, like actually making weapons? Not sure yet. I'd have to check our, our LPA, our, our, our limited partner agreement. We might have to well, make putting some, aside some the LPA, I mean, it becomes a, a really interesting line in the sand. I don't have an answer for it either. It really depends on the orientation of the team and what they're, who they are working for. Um, and yeah, the that's good guys often are the hard bad to guys, yeah. But that's well, hard I mean, to diligence oftentimes. <laughs> we have, uh, there are unmanned aircraft systems, aka drones. Um, which don't have humans on them, but they're, they have humans somewhere. You know, the thing that's, you know, obviously coming uh, is at some point, the Chinese or the Russians or some dictatorship will make a quadcopter that's able to identify, um, you know, the, the uniforms of American soldiers, let's say, or South Korean soldiers. And let's say some deranged North Korean leader decides, I'm just going to send drones that are packed with explosives and when they see somebody in this uniform in these coordinates it's going to just zip a 70 mile per hour drone and, and kill them these are coming and you know if we don't have them the other side's going to have them and it really becomes this arms race like nuclear or what we've seen in space which is you know uh, reportedly some uh, authoritarian countries are already experimenting with disrupting satellites in space with unmanned autonomous flying machines and uh, it's going to be a crazy world if we're not you know on top of it i, I gotta think we are uh you know we we have the ability to put a bomb on top of anything obviously and we already have computer vision so all the components are there really interesting moment i haven't thought it through enough I'll be honest, very I'm asking important, you. Very important sector with yeah. an added bonus if you're an investor of these companies are like not, they, there was no crazy run up on like defense companies in the public markets. And so they are, you, they are not going to be hit in a downturn in the public market. So it's another reason why I'm very bullish defense technology sectorally. Yeah. Um, let's take another couple of questions from our audience. What are your thoughts on uh, AI? Do you invest specifically in the AI space or are you uh, partial towards that category? Question comes from Bob G again, OG Bob G. I wonder, I'm curious who this OG Bob G is now. He's asking interesting questions. It's basically, one of the first 10 people, he's got his notifications on. He's always one of the first 10 to show up for these. Uh, and he's got always got tight questions. Bob G, OG. Nice. Always with the tight questions. Mad, mad props, Bob G. Um, Look, yeah, I, I look, I, I do think AI plays an important role in the future. And, and so I, a lot of, a lot of folks that I know are very skeptical of AI or think that AI is evil or things like that. I don't think things are black and white on AI. I think it's shades of gray and it can be used for, for evil. We're very far from AGI. You have to differentiate like artificial general intelligence from just like narrow applications of AI. Uh, we have several investments that are sort of narrow applications of AI. Uh, and we also have some, some, some exposure and interest in sort of bigger AI, uh, projects, longer term AI projects. And, uh, I, I think it's really important. I think it's one of the most important things that, that engineers could be working on. And, and it's an important part of our portfolio here at Bedrock. Uh, and as we wrap up here, thoughts on the, uh, market, uh, turmoil of the last week. We had, uh, the Friday after. Thanksgiving, I think it was the 26th. Um, this new coronavirus strain sent the markets into a tailspin. Uh, the following it wasn't week, the strain. It wasn't the strain that did it, but anyways. Okay. So uh, the strain was announced, the market collapsed, but I guess you're, in for, you're basically uh, thinking maybe that was the excuse, if I'm interpreting correctly, or just people wanted to take chips off the table. So why not do it that day? People got, people got loaded. People have gotten loaded over the last two years. Um, you know, and there's a lot that Fed's going to raise rates and 
Look, like ultimately, there's a narrow Jeff Lewis experience of every time I've sold a stock, I've regretted it. Literally every single time. Anytime I've sold anything, I've regretted it. Mm. Um, that said, uh, I don't think that's always going to be true. And so I, I think I might end up being vindicated over the next few months on some of my, uh, my poor sales decisions in the past. So we'll see. It is a, uh, you know, when, when it is a great company, if you believe the company will be here for 10 or 20 years, uh, liquidating is uh, almost never a good idea if it's going to stand the test of time. If you were to look at public market companies, let's take out the top 10 that are obviously, you know, we, we know Apple and Microsoft, Facebook, Tesla, Google, these companies, you know, we can be pretty assured they're going to be here in 10 and 20 years. Well, Facebook's we, not here anymore. It doesn't, right, it's it's, it doesn't exist it's anymore. Meta. Yeah, it doesn't exist. It's gone already. It's gone already. Yeah. The collection yeah. of assets formerly known as Facebook. <laughs> but if we look at, uh, you know, everybody else, let's call it the under $200 billion crowd, the Coinbase's, the Robinhood's, the Pelotons, the Airbnb's, the Lyft's, the Uber's, the DoorDash's, the Instacart's. When you look at that cohort of companies, I mentioned some, which ones do you think will be here in 10 years and be doing better than they are today? I mean, Airbnb is going to be a lot more valuable in the future, I think. It is super highly valued today. Like I was just looking at it today because I was like, okay, do I own too much of this company or what, what should I be doing And uh, in terms of my portfolio of public companies? And um, I, it, it is valued like more, I think, than all the hotel companies combined or something at this point. So it feels like the valuation is very high, but feels like that should be more valuable. I'm obviously, you know, you and I have a, are going to have a difference of opinion uh, I, I, on, on Lyft versus Uber. I tend to be, you know, I, bullish on Lyft long term. I was on the board there for many years as we were brawling with uh, with Travis and crew over at Uber. And uh, and I, I think they've got a... Uh, what was that of, like? What was that like going up against Travis? Hell, hell on earth. It was hell on earth. It was hell on earth. <laughs> It's it's, like, it, that's when I knew for sure I was never going to found another company. And I'm like, what these guys are going through... Oh man, the the hijinks behind the scenes. We could do a whole other live stream on that. Yeah, that could be a two hour episode. I mean, the good news is, <laughs> I actually think both of them have an incredibly bright future. You, I can't imagine a world in which DoorDash, right. Airbnb. Infrastructure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and and they're all no longer discounting. They're all hitting profitability. And when people actually look at the core businesses, whether it's Airbnb, DoorDash, you know, Lyft or Uber. The, the potential to throw a free cash flow from those businesses and the number of people who use it. I mean, you're talking about tens of millions uh, or even in Uber's case, over 100 million Airbnb. This is so, these are such large, passionate user bases that are only growing. And if those businesses weren't there, I mean, can you imagine the, the, what life would be like without those companies? I mean, Those they, are they, vibe too, companies. They make vibe. life better. That's what make a vibe fun. company is. Makes life better. Those are all vibe mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. DocuSign I, I is not. Yeah. I will. DocuSign does seem like a, a, you know, a feature inside of Microsoft Word or Carta or any other piece of software. I think Peloton's a vibe company, but it's, it's getting demolished because they were just too popular during the pandemic. But my God, I love that product. And they're just such a passionate group of people they may have gotten ahead of their skis in valuation but i i gotta think peloton has five more products in them uh, i have the hydro and I, I can't imagine that that's not part of peloton or peloton doesn't build a competitor product i have the tonal system i can't imagine peloton doesn't buy that company or come out with their own smart equipment like that is going to be the default equipment in gyms. Like I went to a gym that had a tonal the, when I was at the Austin hotel in uh, the proper hotel in Austin. Cool. They had the tonal. Have you used a tonal before? My friend is the CMO of tonal. So I'd like to give them uh, a huge plug. I should have invested yeah. in that company. Me yeah, too. That's great. Yeah. And, I mean, that's and, but a here's great the great one. part. I go into this hotel. You know, the hotel gyms are not giant. Typically the, the proper hotel in Austin had a, a decent sized gym. And I look and I see a tonal. I'm like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. I wonder how that works. Do I log in? I've never seen a tonal in a gym. You go and it says, if you have a tonal membership, take out your app and scan this barcode, that QR code. I scan the QR code. I kid you not, all of my workouts, all of no my way. history pops up in one second. I was like, my mind just melted. And then I was like, wait a second, is there a Peloton tread here? And there was a Peloton tread, but it doesn't do that. Or I didn't see obviously how to do that. But I think that's going to be the vibe. 
which is you move into an apartment building and they got that tiny little gym that's like the size of a two bedroom and they've got two pelotons two tonals two hydros jason works out look at the, I, you know this is the problem with the live audience you guys didn't notice i lost 21 pounds come on give me some credit here the live audience is dragging me through the comments but that Just to take, me is take, the vibe take your shirt off take it prove it you look you look well, pretty I good mean, to listen, me you gotta take your you, shirt off you chamath and prof g all with your shirts off or like you're making a super team of capital allocators and uh in six more pounds i will be taking my shirt i'm gonna be Good. i'm just giving people fair warning 2022 i'm gonna be wearing a shirt on this week in startups and all in about 50 percent of the time half the time i'm gonna be in a sarong me and chamath <laughs> are committing to all in sarongs and so is sax because he's lost so much space listen Amazing. you're a great guest appreciate you coming on I think we got to book you and uh, you'll put you on the calendar for one year from today. We do a catch up call. Uh, if people want to pitch you, what's the best way uh, to reach you, to pitch you? And, and, and what uh, zone, what stage, what would you like to see in a company when they pitch you? What's too early? What's too late? What's the Goldilocks zone for Jeff? Goldilocks zone is if you think you're going to be one of the most important companies in the world, want to talk to you. Uh, and the best way to pitch me is to figure out what my email is and email me. It's not that hard yeah. if you're a <laughs> capable person. <laughs> if you can't guess the email <laughs> of somebody in a 20-person company, you failed the first test. For me, I have to say, when people come to me and they're like, I have the greatest idea, I can't find a co-founder, I'm like, you done failed the first test, son. Like, If you can't convince one person to come on the journey with you for a bucket full of stock and be your co-founder i know it's not easy but if you don't have the wherewithal to spend a year or six months finding a co-founder you're just not good enough i hate to say it you're just not going to be a founder because that is not the hardest task in the world it's a hard task but that is not the hardest thing you will face all right listen it's been a vibe thanks for coming on the show i think we got everything you have a podcast or a book or a Twitter handle to plug. I gave everybody your Twitter handle before. We'll throw it up on the screen one more time. Any No plugs? Any plugs you want to get out here before no, we go, Jeff? No, nothing to plug. Peace out. Zero. Thanks for having me. All right. And we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups. Bye-bye.